Hi guys, today I am going to teach you guys solubility and chemical equilibrium. So, what is a chemical equilibrium? I am going to use uh, these examples to explain to you guys what chemical equilibrium is. Okay, let's assume that there are two different towns, town A and town B. And town A has a population of 50,000 people. And town B also has a population of 50,000 people. With given information, then you can assume that the populations are equal. That's what equal means, that they have the same quantity. Now, let's take a look at the second example. Now, let's just say that town A now has 100,000 people while town B has a 50,000 people. Based on given information, you know that the populations are not equal. Meaning, the quantity of population between town A and B are not the same. Now, what is then equilibrium? Equilibrium has to do with a change. So let's assume that there is a population change between town A and town B. I'm going to assume that about 5,000 people are moving from um, here, 5,000 people from town A to town B. Meanwhile, 5,000 people are moving back from town B to town A. When the change is constant, therefore the population of the both town does not change, right? Then, then we can call that the populations are, are at the equilibrium. So keep that in mind. Equilibrium has nothing to do with the total population of both towns. It has to do with the change. Because town A and town B are exchanging the equal amount of people, so the population does not change over the time. This is called equilibrium. Okay, so how does it apply to the chemical equilibrium then? First of all, you got to understand the two different things. The first one is called reversible reactions. So reversible reactions is going to be Uh, a chemical reaction in which the product can react to reform the reactant. So meaning the chemical reaction can go forward and also go backward. Not every chemical reaction is going to be reversible and some of them are reversible. For example, let's take an example of a burning a piece of paper. When you have a piece of paper and you bring it close to the fire and it's going to catch on fire and start burning. So after let it burn, you know that the paper is going to turn into ash. The paper now has turned into the ash, which is a different chemical substance. Now the question is, can we reverse the reaction and convert the ash back into the paper? Well, it's obviously impossible. You can't unburn the substance to bring it to the original state. In this case, the burning process is not reversible. How about then uh, you have a um, piece of ice, ice cube, and you are going to apply heat energy to it, and you are going to melt it down. So the ice cube turns into the liquid water. Now, can we reverse the liquid water back into the ice cube? And yes, absolutely. All you have to do is remove the heat energy or simply you freeze the water, right? Put it into the uh, freezer and the liquid water will go back to the ice cube. And in this case, it is considered a reversible reaction. Chemical equilibrium is when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction and the concentration of the product and reactant remains unchanged. Let's go back to the metaphor I just used to explain to you guys. 
Remember, the two different populations in the town A and B were considered equilibrium when people moving from of town A to the B equal to the people moving from town B to the A. When the rate of the forward moving and backward moving are exactly the same, then you know that the total population does not change over the time, even though people are moving. So the chemical equilibrium is just the uh, based on the chemical equation, therefore. Uh, so when you have a forward reaction and a backward reaction is balanced in a reversible reaction, then you know the concentration of products and reactions do not change. And that's when we call them chemical equilibrium. So, uh, let's use uh, an equation that we learned the last chapter in this chapter. So sodium chloride is table salt. So we know that before putting into the water, it's going to have a solid form. And because sodium chloride is going to be uh, soluble in water, once it's put into the water, it is going to have breakdown into the sodium ion and chloride ion. Arrows going both directions here. This indicates the equilibrium in a chemical equation. And this double arrow represents the chemical reaction is reversible. When an excess amount of table salt is placed in water, some salt molecules will dissolve into water and some will remain undissolved. So we can assume that we are going to put in a lot of table salt into the water to the point where some table salt is going to undissolve and stay in their solid state. Therefore, this chemical equation, right, would make sense. Some of them is going to stay in solid while some of them is going to break down and dissolve into the water, and they're going to go back and forth. At equilibrium, molecules of salt are crystallizing at the same rate that molecules from crystal are dissolving. This is also known as a saturation point. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that when you have reached to the chemical equilibrium, Amount of table salt, that solid, right, is going to break down into the uh, ions of salt, uh, table salt, which is process of dissolving into water, is going to be equivalent to the dissolved table salt to recrystallize to go back to the, their solid form. Therefore, the amount of table salt dissolved in the water is not going to change. And this is what we call them saturation point, as we have learned uh, last chapter. This is when the maximum amount of a table salt is dissolved so that you cannot dissolve anymore. This can be also mathematically expressed in formula. And this is the real fun part. Suppose that there are two substances, A and B, and which will react to form products C and D. So I'm going to go ahead and put them into the chemical equation that looks like this. Note, the small case, the lower case A, B, C, and D represent the coefficient that you can obtain from balanced equation. So yes, once you're given the uh, equations, you have to first balance, just like any other chapters. Then, chemical equilibrium constant, which is called K, is going to be expressed in this formula, and you must understand how this works. So chemical equilibrium constant is known as K. This can be uh, expressed by 
this formula. And let me explain to you how this works. Here, the capital letters C, D, A, and B represent the concentration of these four different substances to start with. Okay, remember, the bracket here, these bracket represent the concentration measured in molarity. And those lowercase a, b, c, d, which is the coefficient after the balancing chemical equation, now becomes the power, the exponential power for each one of these chemical substances. Okay, these brackets, okay, these uh, brackets represent the concentration measured in molarity. Okay, here's a practice problem. Consider the synthesis reaction between hydrogen and iodine vapor in a sealed flask at an elevated temperature. So first, write down the balanced chemical reaction. So once you go ahead and write it down into the chemical equation and balance it out, you should have this. Well, hydrogen gas is going to be H2 and iodine gas is I2. Yes, I do know that iodine is typically the solid state at the room temperature, but that's why I had to add this little phrase over here at an elevated temperature to the point where the iodine solid will turn into the gas. And let's say that these two react together and it's called a synthesis reaction. So H and I will combine together. And because the hydrogen has a, um, their charge of a plus one and iodine is minus one, it's going to be one to one ratio. And because there are two hydrogens and two iodines here, I'm going to go ahead and add the coefficient two to balance the chemical equation. So uh, using this balanced equation, I can go ahead and produce a um, chemical equilibrium equation, expression, that's going to look like this. So uh, again, okay. So the product, okay, the product, which is on the right side, is going to be placed on the numerator, and uh, the reactants are going to be placed in the denominator, okay? And remember, the coefficient is actually now going to become the exponential power. So because there are two in front of... Uh, uh, hydroiodic acid, I'm going to go ahead and put the 2 into the second power. Hydrogen gas and iodine gas does not have any coefficient, meaning it's going to be 1. So the power is going to be 1 for each, which I have omitted. And uh, please keep that in mind, okay? There is no unit for the K. K is basically a ratio between the amount of product over the amount of reactant, so it does not have any unit. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and calculate the equilibrium constant K based on the following concentration. So remember, these actually brackets, right? These ones, bra these, bra these type of brackets represent the concentration measured in molarity. So let's just say that I gave you guys these kind of concentration. For the hydrogen gas, it's going to be 0 0.004953 molarity. Iodine gas, 0 0.004953 molarity. And hydroiodic acid is 0 0.003655 molarity. Now, I'm going to go ahead and basically now input, plug in these three concentration into this formula. So when I do that, it's going to look like this. So the concentration of hydroiodic acid, which is 0 0.003655 molarity, but this has to be squared. And I'm going to go ahead and input the concentration of hydrogen gas and concentration of iodine gas according to, accordingly into this formula.
which happens to be the same. Now, using your calculator and using the proper number of significant figures, you report your answer, and which comes out to be 54.46, with no unit and four significant figures, because all three values given to you had four significant figures. Okay, it's your turn now. Calculate the value of a K for the equilibrium constant expression uh, for the synthesis reaction between nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas was given the concentrations below. Now you may pause the video and uh, solve the problem. Okay, here is the answer. So as a just typical problem, you have to first balance the chemical equation. So I am going to actually, uh, I made a little mistake here because I should have let you know what the products were. So let me just tell you that the product, okay, I'm going to have to fix this. The product were supposed to be nitrogen trihydride. So let's assume that uh, you, 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 let's assume that you already knew what the product were. And then if you balance the chemical equation, it comes out to be nitrogen gas, hydrogen gas, and then you can produce the nitrogen trihydride. So once you balance the equation, you're going to have to now put them into equilibrium constant expression, which is this. Again, the product goes to the numerator, reactant goes into the denominator. And the coefficient becomes the power for each one of these concentrations. So NH3 has a 2, so I'm going to put the second power here. Nitrogen gas has one coefficient, so the first power. And hydrogen gas has a three coefficient, which is now third power. Now I'm going to go ahead and plug in these numbers into these each uh, concentration. And then, again, work on the calculation, reporting the correct number of a sig fig, which is going to have three significant figures, which is going to be now 0 0.399. Okay, these are some of the limitations for the equilibrium constant that you need to be aware of. First of all, the value for K is a constant only at a specific temperature. So when temperature changes, equilibrium constant K is going to also change. Do you remember from last chapter we learned, right, the solubility of um, any material is going to be affected by the temperature. If you remember this, the solubility of a solid solute typically and usually increases with the uh, temperature, while the solubility of a gas solute will typically decrease with the increase in temperature. Equilibrium constant K is only calculated for substances that have a variable molarity at different temperatures. So equilibrium constant basically only works for the gases and aqueous solutions. It does not work for the solid nor liquid. This means that the substances in the liquid and solid phases are omitted from the K. And this is going to be pretty important for later on. So keep this in mind. Okay, now we're going to turn into a different types of chemical equilibriums. There are many different ones, for, but for this chapter, I am going to cover the solubility equilibrium. Consider equilibrium system in a saturated solution of silver chloride containing an excess amount of solid AgCl. So a silver chloride. Silver chloride, which is a solid, is going to dissolve in water and is going to produce the silver 
ion, cation, and chloride anion. So this is going to be the chemical equation for that. We follow the convention of writing the equilibrium expression without including the solid uh, species. Therefore, AgCl, which is a solid, is, is not going to appear in the final expression. Remember from last slide, every time you have a solid phase or the liquid phase, it is going to stay out of the equilibrium system. Therefore, KSP, here's a special type of the uh, uh, equilibrium. I'm going to call that KSP. And SP stands for the solubility product. So uh, typically, it should have been, right, AG plus CL minus over AGCL down here as a uh, denominator. But remember, AGCL is actually in solid, so I'm going to go ahead and just take that out of the equation. The resulting equilibrium expression gives the solubility product constant. Again, that's what SP stands for, solubility product, KSP. Here is a practice problem. Calculate KSP when 0.0086 grams of calcium fluoride dissolves in 100.0 milliliter of water. Okay, how do we do this? First of all, again, write down the balanced chemical reaction. So once you uh, write down the chemical reaction, calcium fluoride is going to dissolve in water and generate one calcium ion and two fluoride ions. I'm going to go ahead and write down equilibrium constant for this uh, equation. And again, because calcium fluoride is a solid phase, I'm going to take that out of the equation. So it's just going to be calcium ion multiplied by fluoride ion. And fluoride ion has to be um, squared. That's because of the two coefficient. So in order to calculate this, now we're going to need to know the concentration of a molarity for each calcium and fluoride. Okay, but you need to get this actually from the concentration of calcium fluoride because entire concentration of calcium and fluoride comes directly from the molarity of CaF2 once it's dissolved in water. So in a given question, I gave you how many grams of calcium fluoride is dissolving in water. So using uh, the molarity equation we learned in the last chapter, we are able to calculate the concentration of calcium fluoride dissolved in given water. And we're going to go ahead and use that concentration of calcium fluoride in, to calculate the concentration of calcium ion and fluoride ion. So molarity uh, has an equation, the mole of a solute divided by the liter of a solvent. So I'm going to have to first calculate the mole of solute. So mole of solute can be calculated by converting the mass of calcium fluoride, which is the solute, into the mole. So 0 0.0086 grams of calcium fluoride, and using dimensional analysis, and also using the molar mass of CaF2, I'm going to go ahead and convert this into the mole using two significant figures which is 0 0.00011 mole. I'm going to also calculate the liter of the solvent, which is the water. We were given 100.0 milliliter of water. And again, using another dimensional analysis, or you can also use the metric system to convert the milliliter into the liter. This will give us 0 0.1000 liter in four significant figures. Now, I'm going to go ahead and plug that into this equation and divide the mole of calcium fluoride divide by the liters of the water, which will now give us the concentration of a CaF2 is going to be 0 0.0011 molarity 
using two significant figures. Now, concentration of a Ca plus 2 is also going to be the concentration of a CaF2. Why? That's because when you look at this balanced chemical equation, the molar ratio between CaF2 and Ca plus 2 is actually 1 to 1. That means every time I dissolve certain amount of CaF2 in terms of mole, I'm going to generate exactly the same amount of moles of calcium because they're one-to-one -one ratio. Therefore, the concentration of calcium fluoride equals the concentration of calcium. They're one-to-one -one ratio. Now, what about the fluoride? Fluoride is a little bit different because the molar ratio between calcium fluoride and fluoride is not one-to-one. -one. Because there are two coefficients, so every time I dissolve a calcium, fluor calcium fluoride, CaF2, into the water, right, we are going to generate exactly twice more concentration of fluoride ion because the molar ratio is 1 to 2. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply the concentration of 0 0.0011 mole by 2 and make this one 0 0.0022 molarity. Again, I'm doing that because the molar ratio between uh, CaF2 and F- minus is a 1 to 2 ratio. Now, let's go back to this original equation, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, plug in the numbers. The concentration of calcium was 0 0.0011, while the concentration of fluoride was 0 0.0022, but let's not forget the coefficient, though, right? This coefficient will make the square, right, for this number. So remember, you're going to need to square the second number only, not the first number. So using the calculator and the correct number of significant figures, your equilibrium constant solubility product is going to be 5.3 times 10 to the negative 9th power. And again, there is no unit given for equilibrium constant.